Let's move on to John. Um, John, you, you, you've spent um, a lot of your career working on anti-corruption issues. And, and I know more recently thinking about the links between you know, leakages in the system through corruption and the impacts at a local level in the health sector and in other sectors. But maybe you could share with us some of your, 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 your recent thinking uh, and experiences from Kenya. Thank you. Um, I think um, you know one one of the big uh, you know the two, two two buckets of issues. Uh, one of the key key lessons um, for me um, has been um, the importance you know given our particular context, not only in Kenya but in a range of other African countries, particularly since 1999 when we have had you know reasonably you know consistent economic growth, macroeconomic stability, and now um, in many countries, uh, com commodity booms, um, is the extent to which uh, equity um, has to be at the center of, um, of all development planning, um, given our particular kind of uh, political economy. Uh, inequality is, uh, is easily, is more easily uh, politicized um, than poverty per se and what can be politicized in some of our countries um, can be ethnicized and and also militarized but we've also learned uh, which has been an important lesson when you look at the problem of corruption from the bottom up and and, and struggle with it we you know we started you know with people like Peter Eigen and Jim Wolfenson in, in, the, in the early 1990s trying pushing corruption onto uh, the global development agenda. And the argument then was very much that, um, you know, we used to use a Ghanaian saying, which is a fish rots from the head. So that if you're fighting corruption, you have to start at the top uh, with the president, the prime minister, ministers, etc., and uh, that filters down um, uh, through the system politically. And, and also through the institutions, with the top institution being the judiciary, civil service, security services, etc. Um, and uh, but you know we've come to to discover that more fundamentally that uh, you know uh, you know for example we've had uh, you know uh, we you know consistently all our opinion polls here in Kenya show the police to be the most corrupt institution. Now that's not. Uh, and that's not unique to Kenya. That's really across many developing countries. Uh, police comes out at the, at the bottom. Um, and yet, um, our police training college is being used by some of our neighbors who perform far better than us in terms of corruption. Uh, we have an excellent, so we're producing excellent policemen um, uh, for our neighbors, but not for ourselves. And which forces us to, so it forces us into a more existential question, uh, which, you know, the answer that I have come to when I looked at this issue from the bottom up uh, is that, you know, dignity comes before development, <laughs> the idea before the machine. And um, so uh, at the pragmatic level, the responsiveness of government has to be politically beneficial. Uh, which means that um, you have to do a very clear mapping uh, of your uh, engagement around um, dealing with corruption or implementing development, whether it's in education or, 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 or health or, or any other sector for that matter. Um, the second bucket of issues is, is, is derived from that, which is just understanding and realizing and appreciating that political will uh, is something that is manufactured. It just it doesn't exist. Um, um, it, it, it is manufactured. We we have icons of it uh, in uh, all over the world. You know, people like uh, um, uh, the great Nelson Mandela and, and, and others. But actually, political will is something that is manufactured uh, in in a society and has to be nurtured um, and um, requires a variety of uh, relationships at the local, uh, national, and international level. Um, to to enable uh, some of the most difficult problems vis-a-vis -vis corruption to be dealt with in a, in, a, in a serious way, particularly in situations where the middle class is, is, is still growing, uh, is fragile, 
and is dependent uh, on 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 is heavily dependent on its relationship with the with the state. Um, in 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 that context, uh, you know, my experience has been that, um, uh, especially when one looks at um, uh, the networks that exist, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about public procurement in uh, in, in, in road construction, uh, etc., whether it's at the national and um, um, and now in Kenya we're devolving, so we're going to the state level, even though uh, nothing compared to India, I think an, an Indian state is, uh, well, an Indian city is bigger than the whole of Kenya in terms of population. Um, but um, but it, you know, the same principles apply, is to understand also that um, uh, the relationships, um, the networks, um, um, let me call them the, uh, the networks of corruption are, are the same all over the world. Um, and, and, and they involve four key actors that must be understood when one is engaging uh, in any kind of development activity uh, in, in a sector. And these networks have the capacity to, to capture institutions uh, and also capture processes, either or or both. Um, and uh, this includes politicians who, who ironically are the most disposable parts of the network you know uh, because we have we have uh, political cycles so you know every four five six seven years you know politicians can go so the uh, politicians are key to to uh, these networks um, bureaucrats are also uh, essential um, Surprisingly, um, in my experience, at least in, in uh, uh, across Africa, not necessarily the very top bureaucrats, but the second level and third level bureaucrats, particularly in uh, in, in finance and uh, other key line ministries. Um, then you have businessmen uh, and and key players in the service sector, lawyers, bankers, um, and by businessmen I don't mean. Uh, your typical industrialist who's making spoons, but I'm talking about the broker who who's basically operating out of a briefcase and facilitating transactions and seeking opportunities for rents um, um, in, 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 in transactions. This is another key uh, element. And finally, um, you find that uh, these networks always include uh, officials or, or elements of the security sector it depends on the history of a particular country it could be military it could be intelligence it could be police and understanding these networks um, and um, and how they operate uh, with regard to uh, particular sectors i think is absolutely key uh, to being able to implement uh, uh, development programs that um, uh, where you can actually manufacture the political will that ensures that the politicians are able to continue uh, pushing for reform uh, because it is in their political interest on an on ongoing basis. This has been my, my experience. Um, sorry, that bell is... <laughs> I'm calling from home. Somebody has arrived. That, that, that's probably um, the <laughs> chief inspector for police who's... Uh, <laughs> been listening in to your presentation, John. Which is I'll, 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 <laughs> but, but don't worry, we can witness know. if there's any ugly incidents. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm in your good hands, Kevin. Yeah, yeah well, you're, so, you're, safe, you're safe with us, John. Um, John, let, let me uh, ask you, I mean, uh, this is a slightly broad question, but if you can give a short answer to it that raises what you think are the, the key issues, because... Um, you know, that one of the things that Shanta raised very strongly earlier, you know, was the importance of understanding the political processes that facilitate, you know, in this case, corruption and obstruct yeah. meaningful reform. And a lot of what you do and a lot of what you've done in Kenya is, you know, thinking about the, the counter politics of, you know, how do you form a political movement or create political currents which, you know, which make reform possible? Which shift the parameters, and you know, in, in Kenyan society. I mean, could, could you just maybe give us a few point key pointers on what you you think the key is to the you know the politics of anti-corruption reform? Um, 
I'll, I'll demonstrate with, with an example because I think this is uh, the shortest way. Um, uh, number one, uh, one of the most important lessons that I have learned is that the answers don't don't reside in capital cities, uh, but usually the answers already exist on the ground that um, people have uh, an extraordinary versatility uh, in navigating uh, bureaucracy, in navigating politics on the ground. And so just uh, just the humility, first of all, to, to engage that at, uh, at, at, at that level, to understand, appreciate, listen, uh, for me has been, you know, the key starting point uh, to dealing with these, these issues uh, at, 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 the, at, the, at the ground. Um, secondly, as I said, I, I wanted to, to give an example of you know, one of our key partners, which is actually a school uh, for girls, um, um, which, which was set up um, in the western part of Kenya um, uh, about three years ago by a partner um, with, with, with really no resources. Um, um, and the, the, what they were, she was keen to demonstrate was that it was possible to set up a school for girls um, without any donor funding, um, without any rules, without any rules, a purely value-based institution. And for, and for me, it's something that I we're hoping to put into a case study and be able to share. And so, for, so I'll give you one example: um, the the girls uh, and and this uh, the founder of this uh, of this institution is a, is a is a real mentor of mine. She's one of the most experienced um, uh, educationalists in the country, and has been extremely um, and has been you know grappling with these issues for a long time. Because uh, she came at it from, you know, how come uh, we ha we've we've lost our sense of values uh, in many parts of Kenya, and that feeds into the uh, the culture of corruption, which infects our politics. And so, she created a school based on values. So, for example, when I visited them three weeks ago, um, uh, and now the school is, is, is has, has got three; it's, it's gone up to uh, form three. Um, uh, I found that the girls. Um, jog. Well, they, they don't jog, but they run. Well, they, they walk quickly from class to class, between classes, between meetings. But that decision was made because one of the values is timeliness. And every Saturday morning, they have a meeting and they decide these are the you know, honesty, um, um, timeliness. They have a whole range, honesty. They have a whole range of values that uh, they must uh, 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 expose and live by. How do they express them um, in in their daily uh, um, uh, work in, in the school and at home? Um, and so they took a choice that well, um, we're going to be timely and therefore move quickly from class to class. So it, it's interesting in, in this school they jog from class to class um, and um, uh, in these three years that, uh, that the school has been going um, it's risen up the ranks in that particular province very very quickly it's a small example but one which is very inspiring to but I, I think it is inspiring actually and also very telling because it's a sort of behavioral um, example and a very powerful one I think we, we also know John that when Kenyans walk quickly most of us understand that as sprinting. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, yes. That, that, that is, uh, I mean, it, it's always uh, very embarrassing for uh, foreigners who come uh, and try jogging in Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ken yeah. I, I've done it, yeah. it is embarrassing. Um, yeah. Shanta, yeah. 